Thank you, Yvan. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for the uh, invitation here. I'm very honored to be at IHES and in this uh, summer school. Maybe one word about uh, the other affiliation, the, the name of the math department in Montpellier, which sounds a little bit like the name of the of the, of the lab here, <laughs> CNRS lab here, which is Laboratoire Alexander Grotendieck. So we are Montpellier Institute, uh, well, Alexander Grotendieck Montpellier Institute. Because, oh, of course, uh, uh, Grotendieck is famous for the work he has achieved here, and the, cent the institute here was actually essentially created for him. And um, he was initially a student at the University of Montpellier. His first year at the university was completed in Montpellier, and he uh, finished his career in Montpellier as a full professor. Uh, he finished in the uh, early 90s, I think. So, well, Montpellier and IHES are two important locations for Grotendieck. So, and, well, he loved uh, Isaac Cahedra, the um, 20, 20 facet. Uh, polyhedra and he loved to teach about that. That's what uh, uh, my colleagues in Montpellier told me. Um, okay, now the talk. Um, I will start with uh, what uh, is called here geometric optics, what can be called also um, WKB expansion. WKB expansion usually are met in, uh, for hyperbolic uh, equations or hyperbolic systems. Um, the idea, and that's how I will use them today, is to um, rule out some energy estimates. Essentially, we construct uh, particular solutions and uh, we test energy estimates, and these particular uh, solutions can tell you, no, these kinds of estimates cannot be true. Uh, so, as, as often in this framework, there will be a small parameter uh, which eventually goes to zero, so here it's named uh, epsilon. So, and I will start with that. So, uh, I forgot to say, this is essentially a, a review talk. So, I will present three kinds of results. Uh, hopefully, there will be not too many technicalities. I'll try to give a flavor of the, the method of the proof, but no rigorous proof, say, formal proofs only. So what do I mean by WKB expansion in the framework of uh, Schrodinger equation? So every time there is a derivative in time or in space, uh, there is a factor epsilon. And the initial data are under the form of amplitude, which does not depend on epsilon, and uh, rapid oscillation uh, e to the i phi naught divided by epsilon. And psi is, of course, complex value. The space variable belongs, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, to Rd, and uh, WKB expansion consists in seeking an approximate, at least, uh, formulation of the exact solution like the initial datum. So, and how do we, uh, how do we find A and phi? Well, we plug this into the equation, we order the powers of epsilon and cancel the, from the highest power, well, from, well, from the, high, uh, the larger term, the lowest power, to uh, as many terms as, as possible. So the first term we get so is when we differentiate the phase only. So every time we differentiate the phase, there is one over epsilon factor. But uh, when we differentiate, we have an epsilon factor. So it, it becomes of order one. And this is the iconal equation, which is a Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So if you consider the gradient of phi, it's a multi d Burgers equation. So you have to expect finite time singularity. And the next uh, term in the expansion is a transport equation uh, for the amplitude. And the coefficients of the transport equation are given by the phase. OK, fair enough. And some examples. Um, if the initial phase is linear in x, then we have an explicit formula. So it's linear in xt, the evolution. And there is some uh, dispersion relation, <coughs> as at least physicists call it. And you see that the solution to this Hamilton-Jacobi <coughs> equation is global in time. On the other hand, if you start with a quadratic phase, you still have an explicit formula that shows you that uh, in finite time, and you can compute exactly at what time, the phase becomes singular. Okay. Now, 
uh, nonlinear case. So in, in, in the talk, I will consider only defocusing nonlinearity. So there, there is a plus here. I will write the energy uh, on another slide. So there is no blow up in the uh, sense of formation of singularity. And uh, because it's nonlinear, the size in terms of epsilon here of the initial data is an important parameter. But since I consider homogeneous nonlinearity, I can keep the same, uh, the same initial data as before, and then there is an extra, uh, the, the coupling constant depends on epsilon. And I want to proceed as in the linear case, uh, and this is uh, sensible thanks to the gauge invariance. When you plug this into the nonlinearity, here you have modulus of A to the 2 sigma, and there is one oscillation only, so you still have one oscillation carried by one exponential. So it's, it's, it makes sense. Uh, so let's do the same trick as before, and then of course the discussion will depend on the value of alpha. So let me write the equation once and for all. And we seek C of T and X, well, approximately like, I will not be too precise about the meaning of this. And we plug it into the equation, and now, so the distinction, if alpha is positive, so the, the, the uh, iconal equation, the hamilton jacobi doesn't see the nonlinearity yet, well, supposedly. On the other hand, if alpha equals zero, so this will be of order one, and the left-hand side with phi will also be of order one. So I will just keep this equation for the rest of the talk. That's the only thing that really matters to me. And I will rather write alpha at least one, because as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm really cheating here. It's, more, it's much more tricky than that. Um, okay, so with same initial data. Now the transport equation, so it's, it's terms of order epsilon. So if alpha is larger than one, you still don't see the nonlinear term. You see it, on the other hand, if uh, alpha is equal to 1, and this becomes a nonlinear transport equation, which you can essentially solve. Well, I will not mention today, no. And if alpha is less, less than 1, well, mysterious, but today we don't pay too much attention to that. So there are two critical values, which I will use during the talk. Alpha equal 1, which is this, the the smallest value of alpha for which there is the nonlinear term in these two couple these in these two equations and alpha equals zero which is the worst case because i wanted to consider non-negative alpha where everything becomes uh, coupled and especially here which is hidden so the the only remark uh, i want you to 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 remember today is if alpha is at least one this is the same iconal equation as before, the linear one. And on the other hand, if alpha equals zero, the coupling here is so strong that even if you start with phi naught equals zero, because you have, so at time zero, this is zero, but unless you start with the, the zero initial datum, this will not be zero. So you start from zero, but dt phi at time zero is given by that, so dt phi is not zero, so even if you have no oscillation at time zero, instantaneously rapid oscillation, because it's phi divided by epsilon, will appear. So that's all I want you to remember. <coughs> now back to uh, NLS with no, not yet, small parameter, so defocusing. So now the two of the uh, conserved quantities I will be interested in, so the, the L2 norm, the mass or power of number of particles, depends on the physical context. Um, and the energy, so the energy is a sum of two positive terms. Okay, so now this equation enjoys uh, two important invariances. So this scaling invariance. So if u is a solution, then for any positive lambda, this is a solution to the same equation. And this scaling leaves the uh, homogeneous sub -LF norm uh, hs dot invariant. So forget about time here for S equal SC, which is given by this formula. So maybe I can keep this formula here. 
because well, not so many people use the same notation for the nonlinearity, so I keep the formula here. And the other invariant I want to mention is the Galilean invariant. So if u is a solution, then so is this quantity for every vector v of Rd. And the, the norm which is preserved by this transform is the L2 in space norm. So, and this, this is a clue that, uh, okay, if, if Sc is positive, you can expect some notion of well-posedness. So I don't want to give a precise definition, at least is if S is larger than Sc. So the notion of well-posedness I'm using is the same as uh, Joachim in a previous talk. Uh, that is, I want local pos well poseness not depending on the profile of the initial data, but on the size of the initial data only. So equality would be valid with a different notion of well poseness So and for SC, so SC non-negative means actually that the, the nonlinearity is L2 critical or L2 supercritical. So the numerology means that. So any uh, positive regularity larger than SC uh, will, be, will give rise to a locally well-posed Cauchy problem. And if SC is negative, so if you are L2 subcritical, then uh, Tutsumi has shown that for every non-negative regularity, the problem is locally well-posed from HS to HS. And why do you have to assume that S is non-negative? It's because of the Galilean invariance. Okay, some result concerning the lack of well posedness. So, um, so the first part of the talk, I will always assume that SC is positive, strictly positive. So that means, once again, that the nonlinearity I consider is L2 supercritical, possibly energy subcritical, energy critical, or energy supercritical. And I want to consider, uh, uh, I start from not enough regularity. So S. H, the, the HS regularity of the initial data, S is between 0 and SC. And the first result in this direction is due to Lebo for the supercritical, energy supercritical wave equation, so 3D wave equation, uh, defocusing nonlinearity. And it's energy supercritical, that means that P is at least 7. So, um, well, I won't give the statement, but the result by uh, Lebo. Um, used too many properties, or well, he proved too many properties in order to prove his result, and the, the proof was uh, greatly simplified by Guy Metivier in a Bobaki seminar. Um, for nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, well, similar results, uh, the statement will be probably on the next slide, um, is due to uh, Chris Colander and Tao and Berkshard Vetkov, and the argument, uh, I will resume, uh, on a formal level is the following. You start with concentrated initial data. So think of A0 as a uh, compactly supported, smooth, smooth compactly supported initial data. Okay, now yeah, I have a small parameter H, which is going to zero, and the initial data is concentrating at the origin at scale H. Now there is a renormalizing factor M, and if I want my initial data to be bounded in HM, this boils down to this inequality. And thanks to a scaling I will show later on, we can actually relate. Um, so the, uh, the, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation without epsilon to what happens in the uh, geometrical optics uh, regime with the supercritical case, meaning that here I consider alpha equals zero. So the method of the proof in these, uh, in these papers is the following. For a very short time, so the, the following, so alpha equals zero, there is an OD approximation, which is the following. It consists in neglecting the spatial derivatives here. So the approximate solution, which is considered, is this one. So it seems to be a nonlinear ODE, but if you have ever seen it, you know it's a linear ODE because um, the modulus is conserved. So this is the modulus of the initial datum. And my initial datum after scaling is A0 independent of epsilon. So the solution is given explicitly by uh, A0. by this formula. So what you see is that here you have oscillation like t over epsilon 
So it, 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 it gets rapidly oscillatory. So you can prove by uh, energy estimates that this, the approximation of this function psi by this phi is true for a very short time, I mean epsilon log epsilon, well log epsilon to some power, so this is really short, but this is enough when t, t over epsilon is like log epsilon, which is unbounded, so you have become rapidly oscillatory. And, and then if you are rapidly oscillatory, HS bounds, HS norms become unbounded. So that's essentially the, the picture. Okay, and then uh, I will focus on the, the phenomenon called uh, norm inflation. And well, so the statement about finite uh, loss of regularity so that explains the first part of the, of the title, is the following. So, this, so the, the, f the, the, the cubic case, sigma equal one, uh, was given with one proof. The defocusing higher, uh, well, uh, more than cubic was proven in a joint work with Thomas Lazar uh, for defocusing nonlinearity, and at the same time by Laurent Thoman, and his proof uh, uh, included allowed to consider focusing nonlinearity, which is not which is not possible in the first two papers. Uh, actually, these three papers use three different techniques for the uh, rigorous part I will not explain today, and there would be a fourth uh, proof available now. Um, okay, so the statement is following, so SC is positive, L2 supercritical, S between zero and SC. We can find smooth, rapidly decaying, so Schwarz class initial data, a sequence of initial data, whose HS norm goes to zero, a sequence of time going to zero, along which the nonlinear evolution uh, blows up in HK. So the result by Chris Colander uh, and Tao is for K equal S. So here we allow K to be strictly smaller than S. So this is why I call that loss of regularity. So because, okay, the, the denominator is larger than one, so this is uh, positive. So this is finite loss of regularity because, okay, K is bounded from below. And we'll see why you cannot, exp well, at least we know we have the L2 invariant, so we could not go below uh, L2. Um, so as a corollary, another way to state that is that uh, the, 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 the local Cauchy problem is not well posed from HS to HK. So that means even if you're allowed to pay some loss of regularity in your energy estimate, the loss of regularity has to be at least this one. So there will be no energy estimate uh, for these kinds of, of norms. So, well, final word about the numerology is let's consider uh, S sub, the, in the, the, the sharp value, so that HS is embedded into L2 sigma plus 2. L2 sigma plus 2 is the... Um, kinetic, uh, no, the potential energy in the Hamiltonian. So let me write it here. So the energy so it corresponds to that. So how do we control this guy when we are uh, when, when this is not possible with the first kinetic term, that is when we are energy supercritical. So, so the value of S is given by that, so it's numerology. And what is this formula? This formula is exactly this with S equal S sub. So, so what happens, what, what is the previous statement with S equal S sub? So that means we are in space dimension at least three. This means that we are energy supercritical. So we consider data which are small in HS sub. So in particular, the mass, which is the L2 norm, goes to zero. The energy, so S sub is larger than one, so this term goes to zero. S sub is so that uh, this term is controlled by the H S sub norm. So both terms go to zero. So the energy goes to zero. We know it's conserved. So it will go to zero for all time. On the other hand, the numerology, because of this formula, tells you that Every norm uh, above the energy will blow up instantaneously. And this is, of course, sharp because for k equal 1, we get uh, the first term of the energy. So at least for energy supercritical uh, equations, we know the numerology is sharp. For energy subcritical, well, I don't know. So, and the argument is uh, 
well, it's different from the argument by Lebeau, but the statement is, is the same and, and mm -hmm. the spirit, the formal proof is the same. So I have a question. Like if, if I remember well, like in, in the proof of Lebeau, he, he gets like one initial data for which he gets loss of regularity. Yes. Whereas here you, have, you need like a, se a sequence. So the only difference that we have is that you have finite speed of propagation so for the wave. That idea, like no, but well. Um, can I ask you to ask me the question at the end? Okay. Because there is a longer answer. Uh, okay, so the formal proof uh, is the following. So like uh, Chris Collin, Dottao, and Burkhard Zvetkov, we consider concentrated initial data. With so this is so that the HS norm is of order one, but HS plus blows up as H goes to zero. And okay, uh, if you want to introduce semi-classical parameter, you, you play with, uh, with these factors. So you modify the parabolic scaling with this epsilon. So you, and the goal is to get, to get this with alpha equals zero. Okay, so the formula that comes out is this one. And you see that epsilon and h go to zero simultaneously exactly because you are considering a supercritical situation. S is smaller than Sc. So we have this and the initial data do not oscillate. So the relation between, well, the given by scaling is that one. And the key phenomenon I wanted you to remember is this one. For at time tau of order one, so that means we're not using this. We're using something which is much more uh, uh, sophisticated. And the proof, well, I will say a word about it uh, on in the remark. The proof is, uh, is completely different. So Psi is epsilon oscillatory in the sense that the phase has become of order one. So we have this epsilon oscillation here. So now, well, let's plug this into the, uh, the formula. So that means for we have this. So it's um, at T h square epsilon. So in h dot m will be of order so this. So psi is epsilon oscillatory. So that means when we differentiate m times, we have epsilon to the negative m. We plug the formula for epsilon. So get h s minus m minus m sigma. And this power is negative exactly for m strictly larger than the formula that was in the statement. So this is where the loss of regularity comes from. Because you start, for psi, you start with something which is not oscillatory, but which becomes oscillatory, rapidly oscillatory, instantaneously. OK, so it's, it's at time tau of order 1, which is larger, much larger than this epsilon log epsilon. And actually, to prove the ODE approximation, you just use energy estimates in uh, high order suborder spaces. Uh, in short time, because eventually you, you invoke uh, Grunewald inequality. But if you want to go up to time of order one, you need quasi-linear analysis in um, defocusing case or analytic setting, which also covered um, the, uh, def the focusing case, um, which means that for fixed epsilon, this is an, uh, well, you solve the equation by a fixed point argument. Uh, this is a perturbation of the free flow. So it's semi-linear analysis. So when introducing this semi-classical parameter epsilon with alpha equals zero, in a way, the problem has turned much more nonlinear. So to, to justify this one line, well, is the tough part, which I will not say more about today. OK, now, what if a side remark, essentially? Um, what if the Laplacian is modified? So you consider. Uh, a Fourier multiplier, P, the important uh, assumption is that P is real valued. Uh, so the group, because P is, is real valued, the free group is uh, unitary on every sub life space based on L2. So essentially, if P is M homogeneous, well, the scaling yields this uh, uh, critical in this uh, index. And indeed, you can prove that there is norm inflation in the same sense as in the paper by Chris Colander et Tao, I'm not claiming loss of regularity, just norm inflation, il posnos from HS to HS. And this, the proof is the same, so same proof, what do I mean by same? It's the approximation, uh, 
the approximation here. Essentially, what we do is that. So it's, so it's not P, uh, because well, the notation are not consistent, but essentially, the proof is this one. So we approximate this by that. And OK, so there are two cases. So either P is M homogeneous, so this will uh, be, be really unbounded, or P is bounded. And actually, the difference is what is the critical Sobolev uh, regularity? So we know that there is, of course, local well poseness above HD over 2 because it's an algebra embedded into L infinity. And actually, when P is bounded, you can prove uh, norm inflation, essentially um, by this ODE approximation, for any S strictly smaller than D over 2. And, OK, so the side remark is that this first statement implies that there, there is no strict art, well, isotropic strict art estimate improving on sub LF embedding. So the statement is following. So strict art, uh, strict art admissible pairs are given by uh, this algebraic relation. And sub LF norm, sub LF embedding tells you that, OK, LQ is controlled by this sub LF norm. Um, but in sub LF spaces based on L2, the, un the group is unitary, so we have actually equality from this line to this line. And, uh, okay, I'm considering finite time interval, so order inequality roughly gives that. So here is what is given by sub LF estimate. So the corollary is the following, so is suppose that for some finite time intervals th there is an admissible pair, a K, uh, a real K, such that you have something like that. So remember uh, yesterday in the talk by Nicolas, uh, the, he recalled the, the result by Burjard Vetkov that states that on a compactly supported manifold, you can take k equal 1 over p, which is uh, half what you get by sub LF embedding. So there is an improvement. Here, what, what I'm saying is that if p is bounded, the, the Fourier multiplier, then k, if this is true, k is larger is at least 2 over p. So you cannot improve in such a statement. You cannot improve over sub LF embedding. And well, um, indirect proof is the, the following. So you can solve the, uh, suppose you have some gain. So, uh, so it, it, it's really re re rewriting the, the proof by Burkhard Vetkov on uh, 2D manifolds. So suppose you have something that improves over uh, sub LF embedding. That is k strictly smaller than 2 over p that is 1 over p, for instance, in the case of a uh, compactly supported manifold, so that you have this. Then you can solve the non-inertia Schrodinger equation locally in time with this numerology. Um, OK, so it's well posed in HS, where S is here. Sigma is here, so the p is given by the uh, strict art inequality. So we take sigma equal 1 to infer the corollary, so that means cubic defocusing nonlinearity. And the proof essentially relies on a fixed point in this space. So, and this is where we use uh, st this strickert like inequality. And the fact that since we have this assumption, then we have the embedding, which is very convenient to treat nonlinear terms. So it's just rewriting the proof by Gershard Metkov. And then, OK, suppose you had something like that for so some k strictly smaller than 2 over p, then you could solve the problem below the HS, HD over 2, but you know you can't, so there is no such inequality. So last part of the talk is lack of, so it will be infinitely, if infinite loss of regularity. So now I consider negative regularity. So we know that, so there was this threshold here, and there was the other threshold given by Galilean invariance, which is S equals 0. So now I'm below S equals 0. So there are also already uh, there are many uh, results concerning the lack of local well poseness. So in 1D, Chris Coriander et al. proved that there is no local well poseness from HS to HK, provided S is negative, and this is true for any K. So no matter how near to in minus infinity K is, it's not locally well posed. So this is already a hint of infinite loss of regularity. So there will be a more precise statement later. So it was refined by uh, Molina in the cubic 1D case. And so I will present uh, generali ge some generalizations uh, in, the in the next slides. Um, 
And again, if I want to translate it well, into the uh, terms uh, of geometric optics, uh, WKB expansion, here is the, the, the picture. We start with a semi-classical Schrodinger equation, but with an epsilon here. So this is alpha, no, so from now on, I will consider only alpha equal 1. So I will just keep this. So the iconal equation for a single phase WKB expansion is this one. So and the idea is that you start from two rapid oscillations, one of which is not an oscillation at all. Um, and actually, you can compute exactly the leading order approximation. So that means you can uh, determine A0 and A1 of T. So this is a exactly the solution to the iconal equation with initial datum X1. So I give, I, I, I've shown the, the explicit formula. In that case, it's, it's this one. And the, the main idea is that this is true up to a reminder of order epsilon in uh, the Wiener algebra Fourier of L1. And why is Wiener algebra a convenient framework is that, OK, the name highly suggests this is an algebra. This is indeed an algebra thanks to Young's inequality embedded into L infinity. And uh, the nice thing is that the uh, W norm of this guy does not see the, uh, the, the, the plane oscillation. So, okay, so as I said, we have a formula for A0, A1. They are coupled. And unlike the first part of the talk, which was a transfer from low frequency to high frequency, the, the appearance of rapid oscillation, here, when you consider negative sub-LF spaces, the phenomenon is transferred from high to low frequencies. So high frequency is this one because it's rapidly oscillatory. Low frequency is this one because there is no oscillation. And the idea is that you take alpha naught small, alpha one large, and then alpha one will feed alpha naught, and A naught will be large. So that's the, the, the rough picture for this case. Okay. And now, uh, uh, some uh, a more quantitative statement. So, um, Chris Colonna and Tao have also proved lack of well poisonous with norm inflation in the same sense as before, from HS to HS. So the target is the same as the, the, the initial space. Um, in dimension, at least two. I will explain why two uh, later on. The argument of uh, Bezunaru and Tao, uh, based on a Picard iterative scheme, uh, makes it possible to prove rather easily the lack of well poisonous from HS to HK for every K. So like the, uh, the initial case on the, uh, on the circle uh, I mentioned before. So now the result, uh, I won't mention too much uh, today, is the following. Suppose we are at least in dimension two. Sigma is a natural number. That means the nonlinearity is smooth. And, well, there is this upper bound, which is not uh, very pleasant, but we don't know how to get rid of it. So if S is larger than this value, so we would expect rather S negative. But we have this value, which is at least better than negative D over 2, because D is at least 1. So this is smaller than, uh, well, 1 over 2 sigma plus 1 is larger than, uh, is smaller than 1. So, and the statement is the same as before, in a way. So, we have small initial data, which are smooth and uh, rapidly decaying. So, they go to zero. The sequence goes to zero. And a sequence of time going to zero, along which all, that's absolutely all, the sub-LF norms blow up at the same time. So This is why I call this infinite loss of regularity. So, you, you cannot expect any energy estimate involving a, a, a sub-LF uh, norm on the left-hand side and the initial datum in that space. Okay, so I will rather insist on the periodic case, so and because there the assumption is simply S negative. And the other, uh, okay, so now periodic case. So, well, this is uh, a joint work with uh, Thomas Kapler and uh, uh, he's more expert than I am on the periodic case, so he noticed that the proof was valid in Fourier-Lebesgue space, which are generalized sub space. 
So I don't want to describe them too much. Just think that if P is 2, this is the HS sub LS space, and this is something slightly more general. So you can read the statement with P equal 2. That's, uh, I mean, that's already the, the main picture. So suppose D sigma is at least 2. So it turns out that that means you are L2 critical or L2 supercritical. So the, the way it comes out in the proof is that either, so sigma is always an integer. So either sigma is, uh, is 1 and, and more, and D is at least 2, or in 1D we can allow quintic nonlinearity and higher. So this is just to rule out the 1D cubic, essentially. So the 1D cubic is the second case because it's less satisfactory. So pick any negative S, then we can find a, a, a sequence of smooth initial data with, say, HS norm goes to zero, and a sequence of time going to zero, along which all the sub -LF norm blow up at the same time. So it's any sub -LF regularity R here. So the same as on RD, except that here this is more satisfactory. And in the cubic uh, 1D case, we have this uh, abstraction that S has to be smaller than negative two-thirds. And then the statement is exactly the same. So negative two-thirds, we know for sure it's not uh, sharp uh, in order for the problem to be uh, not to be locally well-posed. Uh, for instance, by the result by um, Hiro O, uh, 1D cubic, he proved that if S is at most negative one-half, the st same statement is true, but with R equal S. So it's norm inflation, not loss of regularity, but norm inflation. And also, there is a modification in the cubic case, uh, 1D or higher, uh, because it's been known uh, since at least the work by Chris Collier and Tao that the zero mode plays a crucial role in all instability issues. So there is this uh, Vick order equation that consists in removing the zero Fourier mode from the nonlinearity. But actually, uh, the proof does not see the difference when you remove that. So, so the statement remains valid. OK, so one word about multiphase. Uh, so weakly nonlinear geometric optics. Weakly is because here we have an epsilon, and that means that the, the iconal equation is the same as nonlinear in the linear Schrodinger equation. So weakly means that the only thing that may see the nonlinearity is not the phase, but the amplitude. So we start from um, possibly infinitely many uh, linear phases, so in with this small parameter epsilon, and we look for an approximate solution of the same form. So the idea is how can we choose phi j and how do we choose a j? So phi j, well, they will solve the iconal equation and since we start with linear in x phases, we have an explicit formula which is recalled here. So we know the phi j, so the goal is to determine the evolution of the amplitude a j. And eventually the picture is the following, is that we will start with um, alpha naught equals zero, so no zero Fourier mode, and by nonlinear interactions of non-zero Fourier mode, the zero Fourier mode will appear instantaneously. So there will be a transfer from high uh, frequency to low frequency, the lowest possible frequency, which is zero mode. Okay, by when you plug when you plug um, such an expansion, so. into the equation, you have to look at the nonlinearity. So every time you see a psi here, you plug this. You ex so you have uh, many sums, two sigma plus one sums. And the phases you get, because of gauge invariant, the new phases you get is this one. And since each of these terms in linear in Tx, the outcome is linear in Tx, so it will be of this form. And what we will call resonance, and I think you will uh, hear about that uh, later on during this summer school, is if the outcome that you get by nonlinear interaction is also a solution to this uh, iconal equation, and the well, what physicists call dispersion relation is exactly that omega is uh, 
length of j squared over 2. So, and the natural definition of resonance set is, so this is what you get by uh, combinations of such phases. So, uh, so this is, so yeah, let's say that phi j will be kj dot x uh, minus kj squared over 2 t. So you take li linear combinations of this like above. So it's kj, sorry. So the linear combination in x will give you this relation. So we have j dot x. And we want this to be a solution to the iconal equation, that is the, the resonance condition is satisfied, which is given by this other algebraic relation. So the resonance set is this one, and the claim is that only this resonance set matters. Because uh, if you have the first relation but not the second relation, because we work with integers, then non-stationary phase argument tells you that in the equation, when you plug this into the equation, it gives rise to a source term which will be of order epsilon squared, because here we have epsilon, and then uh, energy estimates in Wiener algebra, for instance, tells you that uh, this gives rise to a reminder of order epsilon. So only this resonance set matters. So in the cubic case, so in the cubic case we have only three terms there, the description of the resonance set is given in the, the paper by uh, uh, Coliander, Kiel, Stafilani, Takaoka, and Tao that Giliola uh, mentioned yesterday. Um, and uh, the resonance, well, the resonance set is fully described by an, al an algorithm based on the completion of rectangles. So you essentially use uh, uh, Pythagore's theorem to, 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 to get this description. And for quintic and higher nonlinearity, it's more intricate, but we don't have to fully describe because, as I said before, uh, it's enough to start from non-zero phases and create the zero phase. And that's all we want. We don't need a full description. So, and a remark, if you can generate a resonance in a cubic case, you can generate the same resonance by just copying the, the, the last phase for higher order nonlinearity. So, I, I, what you can do in cubic, you can do in for higher nonlinearity. And, yeah. Okay, so the key example, so which is an example of the rectangle uh, completion, is you start from these three phases. So it's th this is why we have to assume d is at least two. So the, the last d minus two coordinates, if any, can be taken to zero. They don't matter. So it's a 2D phenomenon. You start from these three phases. So x1, x1 over epsilon, x1 plus x2 over epsilon, and x2 over epsilon. And then, of course, it's easy to check this relation. So zero is a resonance. So that means by the completion of rectangle, you start from three non-zero Fourier modes. And by nonlinear interaction, you expect to create the zero Fourier mode. So transfer from high to low frequency by this example only. So the, um, the amplitude here are given in the periodic case by this uh, relation. So you restrict to resonance set. If you didn't restrict, that would be just rewriting the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in Fourier uh, variables. So you restrict to this because that's only what matters. And so the word of caution is that it's not bec bec because you know that uh, phases resonate that this term will actually appear. So in the 1D case, where cubic 1D case, so you have this... Uh, completion of rectangles algorithm, so you have flat rectangles because it's 1D. Actually, this equation, you can see that it uh, simplifies in a way that the modulus of each term is conserved. So if you start from zero, no way, you will remain zero. So that's why uh, the previous statement was bound to 2D and higher dimension. So it's, this was a multi-D phenomenon. And then, okay, now if you are at least two-dimensional and consider the previous, uh, the previous uh, examples where essentially you start from three oscillations and they will create zero mode. If the uh, associated amplitude is the same for ev each of the three, you can see that the zero mode is indeed created. 
by this equation. Okay, um, no, if it can. So just a word. So once again, uh, non-stationary phase argument makes it possible to show that in L2 intersected with the Wiener algebra, this is indeed a good description of the exact solution. And well, maybe just to, to finish, well, it's probably too late to... So the idea, well, I will just comment with hands. So you use a scaling. Scaling in a periodic case may be tricky. So that's why epsilon n is a carefully chosen sequence going to zero. Um, carefully means we, are, we want to remain periodic. We use scaling in order for psi, given by the scaling by, uh, some, uh, by this relation. We want psi to solve this in order to use the previous approximation. So that means for u naught we consider this. You, we measure the HS norm of this guy. So we have this factor and we take the HS norm. So every time, well, that means you take this power of epsilon n to the s, to the, ne uh, well, this negative power of epsilon n to the s. So the HS norm is at time zero is of this order. So s is negative, this is this. I want this guy to go to zero. So this is one condition. And you see that uh, any positive b, uh, well, you can always find positive b so that this is true because s is non-zero. And uh, creation, so there is creation of the zero mode by this algorithm, by this geometric optics approximation. So once again, you rescale time. So a time which was of order one here becomes a time going to zero in terms of u. And we can bound from below any absolutely any sub LF norm by the zero mode. So that's the only idea. And the zero mode has appeared. And in front, we have this factor. And if beta is positive, this, of course, goes to infinity. So that's it. And now it's just, uh, well, it's just algebra. And we see that essentially because for as when the zero mode is concerned, every sub LF norm is equivalent. So that's the idea to conclude. So we know that the approximation also makes sense at the level of the solution U. So maybe one word about the quintic and higher nonlinearity. So it, one example is enough. So Greber and Thurman gave some examples where they wanted this, the first and third phase to be equal. So with Thomas, we constructed other example, examples based on uh, Pythagorean uh, triplets. So I was happy uh, to, to pretend I was doing some number theory for once. Um, and essentially the approach is the same as before. You create from this, uh, you create the zero mode. So you, you, t you start from five mode and they create the zero mode. And the same picture as before. So we don't have to fully describe the nonlinear thing. And the 1D cubic, so 1D cubic, as I said before, you cannot create the zero mode at leading order. So at, at leading order is important. So we look at the next term in the WKB expansion. The next term will be of order epsilon. And essentially, we, we construct it. And we, uh, well, the outcome, well, everyone is tied, including the speaker. So I will say that the outcome is, if you start from non-zero mode here, the zero mode will not appear at this order, but it will appear here. So, and when you, well, we have an explicit formula, which is nice. And then when you do the, numer the same numerology as before, if you want the initial data to be small, um, to be small in HS, the requirement is this one. And if you want the, the, this reminder term to blow up the evolution, you have to require this. And this is why, uh, well, the, uh, you get the negative two-third critical exponent by this approach. And probably by this approach, you cannot improve, improve the statement, but it's certainly not sharp. OK, thank you. Because in, in it means that you start with a fixed data in the space and then at the time you are out of that space. Yeah. But here it's not exactly It's not exactly it, it, it tells you it tells you that if you have if you if you expect uh, energy estimates they will involve loss of regularity. 
So it's not uh, exactly constructive. It's just that you rule out some energy estimates. And in, in the L2 supercritical case, you know that you have a minimum amount of regularity to, to, to be able to be ready to lose. So with this lower bound on K, given by this numerology, and in negative regularity, there's no way you can expect any uh, sub LF estimate. So that's the whole picture. Just to go a little further with this question, but you expect a, a, a situation where okay, you are almost a starting point from the equation, you get to the lower. Okay, so uh, one of your parameters, small enough for what you have, you will blow up in the norm by the mm -hmm. The free will blow up in the sense. Now you are getting uh, fixed data you now and. Uh, you are going above, you, you, you are not able to perform your computation, but then you are it leads to the analytic. If, if you are energy supercritical, uh, you can use scaling to, to blow up arbitrarily soon, but uh, besides that, I, I don't have any answer. Not that I know, but it's a very interesting question. Yeah. I've never I've never thought of it this way.